والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله اما بعد قال الله عز وجل واتم الحج والعمره لله صدق الله المولاي العظيم we should be grateful that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala has given us the strength to participate so that we can educate ourselves about performing Umrah and say Alhamdulillah. Let's say Alhamdulillah now. So how to perform Umrah? People sometimes when they hear I'm going to perform Umrah, it's very difficult. I need someone to come with me. I need a guide there. And we ask, the person who's arranging our package is there anybody there to help me? In reality, performing Umrah is very easy. It's really easy to perform Umrah, as you realize. The problem arises when we don't educate ourselves of the simple way of performing Umrah. So performing Umrah is simple, but we don't educate ourselves of this very simple way of performing Umrah and that's why we become a bit frustrated at times and you know we don't know how, how to go, go about it etc. But inshallah from this session we will learn that performing Umrah, if you do it right and correctly, it's very simple. Simple four steps and your Umrah is complete. So first of all, we're going to learn inshallah the virtues of Umrah. There are many virtues of Umrah, there are many narrations of Ahadith. But I have selected a few here because they mention different virtues of performing Umrah. Forgiveness of sins, removal of poverty, whatever you ask from Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give. Some people it is, it is in the same sense of receiving the reward of participating in jihad. So lots of virtue, there's lots of videos online that you can watch where the virtues of Umrah and Hajj is mentioned. So don't think to yourself that you're going and it's it's just like you know going on a holiday etc. No. This is for your afterlife, for your year after. Some important points to uh, remember before we go for Hajj or Umrah is number one, correct your intention. Don't think to yourself that I'm going to stay in this hotel, it's close to Haram, buffet breakfast is provided, and it's really nice. Good reviews on booking.com. Oh, I'm going with Saudi Airlines, I'm going with Qatar Airlines, really good you know, flights. That's not the mentality we should have. And our intention should be that we are performing Umrah or we are going for Hajj to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ that go and perform Hajj, go and perform Umrah, Lillah, for the sake of Allah, to please Allah. There should be no other intention, only to please Allah wa ta'ala. Okay? Number two is learn the virtues of performing Umrah and the different acts to perform in the uh, Arab and the Masail of Umrah. If you learn the virtues and you go, then when you're there, you'll remember that this is the virtue of doing this, this is the virtue of doing that. Let's go and do this. We don't know when we're going to come back again. If you learn the Messiah, then you will make sure that your acts are performed in accordance to Quran and Sunnah. But if you don't learn them, then you're going to miss out on things. Also learn about the historical sites. Learn about what, what happened in masjid e qiblatain in masjid e quba what is the significance of Arafah, Muzdalifah, Mina, the Rabi Jabarat? People visit these places, they go for Ziyarat. But you know, a lot of people don't know why they're going there or what is the significance of that place. So this is why learn yourself. Whenever you go, always do your research. Learn. Number four is learn the Messiah of journey as well. What is the Umrah Messiah? Second is journey, you're going on a Safar. When you go on a Safar, more than 48 miles, you become a musafir. What should you do? What shouldn't you do? All of these masail are very important as well. Plan your journey. Plan your journey. If you're going on your own and you've booked everything on your own, plan your journey. On this day, I'm going to do this. On this day, I'm going to do that. If you plan your journey, you will be able to, inshallah, fit more things in 
and it will be a more easy routine to daily routine to follow. If you don't plan, then you're not going to maximize the benefit of your journey of Umrah. Set some targets. Your target might be that I want to pray every single salat in Al Masjid Al Haram. That should be a minimum target of everyone. There's no work there. There's you know nowhere to go, etc. The only thing should be hotel Haram Sharif. Hotel Haram Sharif. Hotel Haram Sharif. You should not make any namaz qada. If you make namaz qada there, where are you going to pray? What where else? So that's why set yourself some targets that I'm going to spend as much time as possible in Haram. I'm going to do one khatam of the Quran. Minimum, I'm going to do okay, read you know two sides of the Quran, one side of the Quran. The best thing to do is you go half an hour before salah, before the it starts to increase the crowd, and you start reciting the Quran. And then after Salat, leave them the half an hour and read the Quran. Why? Because everybody is leaving at that time. There's a crowd at that time. Let the crowd disappear. And then you will find it easy to enter and, and, and exit inshallah. So after Salat, straight away, don't try to leave the haram. Stay, stay inside. And the last is, once you come back and once you perform your Umrah, bring change to your life. If you come back and it's all the same again, then what was the whole purpose? Of, of spending 14 days, 10 days in a spiritual state. You know, was there any change? So that's very important as well. Bring change to one's life, inshallah. There are four acts in Umrah. This is how simple Umrah is. There's only four things to do. How many things? Only four things to do in Umrah. Number one is you put your ihram on. You're going to go in detail, inshallah. You put an ihram on. Number two is you do tawaf seven times around the Kaaba. Number three is sa'i from Safa, Marwa, Marwa, Safa, Safa, Marwa, seven times. And right at the end, if you're a male, you do halak or qasr. The halak, you receive more reward. If you're a female, then from the bottom of your hair, round the finger and cut off, inshallah. And that's, that's, your, your Umrah complete. Can you see how easy it is? Put your your ihram before you reach the Miqat. Once you reach Mecca, put your bags away, come to the, come to the Masjid Al-Haram, go seven times round the Kaaba, then go seven times Safa Marwa 1, Marwa Safa 2, Safa Marwa 3, and then Halak al Qasr. That's how easy Umrah is. But it's not always as easy as this, is it? Why? Because things happen. And you don't learn the Masail. For some things, you, you must be in the state of wudu. For some things, it's okay, acceptable if you don't do it with wudu. Uh, so this this Muslim aside, obviously. Now, ihram is like the kbira tahrima, like the kbira tahrima. In salah, you say Allahu Akbar, the kbira tahrima. And then, how do you come out of salah? I say salam, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. So to enter into salat, this tadbir al tahrima, to come out of salat is salam. It's the same with umrah. To go into umrah, the tadbir al tahrima equivalent is the ihram. By wearing the ihram, becoming a muhrim, you go into the state of ihram and into your umrah. And then once you finish, the salam is like halaq and qasr. You do halaq and qasr, now you have come out of your umrah. Clear? Okay. Now, once you said in takbir al-tahrim, Allahu Akbar, can you eat now? You're taking time to say that. Can you drink now? Can you talk to somebody else? So there are things that you can't do, which you were allowed to do before you started Salat, as soon as you say Takbir al-Tahrima, many things become forbidden. In the same way, when you put on your ihram and you become a muhrim, then many things which were permissible are no longer permissible now. You follow me? Okay. So for example, you can't put on in the state of ihram any perfume, any scent. You can't use any soap or anything that has fragrance. You can't cut or shave hair. There are many other things like that as well, which are the prohibitions of our haram. 
Okay. So now, what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to put on the ihram first. So the ihram for male, because for female there isn't really much, but for male it's two sheets of cloth. This is a very old one. Got safety pin there. So, two sheets of cloth like this for male. And that's your ihram. How do you wear the ihram? So, before you wear the ihram, you should perform ghusl. If you can't perform ghusl, then perform wudu. If you're wearing the ihram, Say that, for example, from home. Say, for example, from a hotel. Then you can perform ghusl easily. But if you're putting your ihram on from an airport, you can't really perform ghusl. But you can perform wudu. So you perform wudu, and then you put your ihram on. The way to put your ihram on is, there are different ways. So bring it around you like this, and the two ends in front of you like that. Okay? Once you've got it there, hold it, and then like that. Make sure it's above the ankle, just like clothing must be general, above the ankle. And then you hold it like that. You'll hold it, inshallah. I've just not done it tight enough because of the mic. Okay? The other thing you can do is, once you've got it like that, you can put on a belt. You know, belt you wear for your jeans, for your trousers, or you can buy specific uh, umrah belts. Big, white, thick belts with money to put some uh, pockets to put some money in that you might need for the barber afterwards. So you can put on the belt and the belt will then you just overlap it like that. The other way to put on your haram is you spread your leg out so when you're walking there's enough. So you put your leg out a bit, put this like this, like that. Now put your belt and just roll over. But make sure it's above your ankle. Now there's enough room for you to walk. Clear? You, you might, you know, be comfortable in putting it on in a different way. The aim is that one sheet weighs down. And the second sheet is for shoulder down. Like this. Okay. So now you put your ihram on. You can't wear anything on your head. In the state of ihram, you can't wear anything on your head, no shawl, no shima, no imama, no hat. Your head has to be exposed. You can't wear any socks. Like for example, here I've got socks. You can't wear shoes, boots. So what you wear on your feet are sandals like this, or flip-flops like this. Okay, because the bone on the top of your feet has to remain exposed. Why is it like this? Why are we dressing like this? When Islam encourages so much about covering everything up? Because people when they go to school, they wear uniform. Everyone is the same here. No one person is better than the other. If we did not allow that, what would the rich one wear? You'll probably have your haram of gold. You don't know, people will come to show off. Allah says, everyone is the same. And just like you came to this world, the same, you will return back to me the same. Everyone is the same. The other is, when you come with just two sheets of clothing, which is really like kafan, you've got nothing else with you, and you shouldn't have. You shouldn't be carrying your wallet with you, and another stuff, another bag, and everything you've left behind. The same way you're reminding yourself, when I leave this world, 
This is exactly how I'm going back. They're going to cover me with kafan. There'll be no mobile phone with me, none of my bank cards with me, no cash with me, nothing with me. That's how I'm going to leave this world and be buried. So it's a way of reminding yourself that this world is temporary and this is how I am going to return back and everyone will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. So we did ghusl or we performed wudu and then we put on our ihram. For female, the ihram is their normal clothing. The only thing they can't do is have any face covering that touches their face. They can't touch the face. So they have to cover wear the scarf, they can wear their jilbab, etc. But they can't wear anything that covers their face. But if they need to cover their face, there's these caps you can purchase where it covers the face. But it doesn't touch the face, the skin. After that, after you put on your ikram, ghusl or wudu, put on your ikram. Now, if you want at this time, you can still put on some ritual and perfume. Before putting on your ihram, any hair in the uh, on the body that's usually removed, etc., should be removed. You should clip your nails because if it's for Hajj, then for quite a number of days you're going to be in this state. So, like trimming moustache, them kind of things, shaving under the armpits, you know, removing hair like that, and you're in a clean state now. So, you put on your ihram, if you want, you can put on some ritual, and now you are going to perform two rakat salat. How many? Two rakat salat. Once, uh, in performing two rakat salat, in the first rakat, after Surah Al Fatiha, you recite, Ul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. Surah Al Kafirun. In the second rakat, after Surah Al Fatiha, you recite, Surah Ikhlas. Ul Huwa Allahu Ahad. These are the two surahs that you should recite. You can recite any surah, but these are the two surahs you should recite. So you've prayed your salah. Number one is ghusl or wudu. Number two is ihram. Number three is salah. Number four, this is where you become muhrim. This is where now all those other things that you were allowed to do becomes forbidden upon you. You recite the talbiyah. You recite the talbiyah. But just before talbiyah, you need to make intention, niyyah. Intention and talbiyah. Keep it hand in hand. The intention you can make in any language, just like salat, you make it in any language. But if you wanted to recite in Arabic, in Arabic in the books they write that Allahumma inni uridul umrata fayassirha li wa taqabbalha minni. Allahumma o Allah, inni I uridu intend. You can read the way to Sufi will recite as well. Al umrata to perform umrah. So accept my umrah from me and what the minni uh make the umrah easy for me and what the minni and accept it from me. Okay. Inshallah those coming, I will say all this there again as we go through and prepare for our uh, our umrah. After niyat, we make niyat now, now we decide talbiyah. Talbiya is Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik, La Sharika Laka Labbaik, Inna Alhamda, Wal Ni'mata Laka Wal Mulk, La Sharika Laka. This is one Talbiya. Soon as you recite Talbiya, now you become Muhrim. Muhrim means that you're in the state of Ihram, you're in a special state now. You're in a very uh, spiritual state now. And in this day, many things now become forbidden for you. Okay? When you recite Talbiya. One piece of advice, and again all of this I'm sharing with you from experiences, not myself, other people who are in the group. We were going with Turkish airline one, airline once, and it flew from Manchester to Istanbul. From Istanbul to Jidda was the next flight, the connecting flight. And in the Istanbul airport, we put on our ihram. Everyone was allowed through except for two individuals who were in the state of Ihram. So they were not allowed on board the flight. Eventually, after some paperwork and documents, etc., they were allowed to come the next day. But that full one day in the state of Ihram, they were running around in Istanbul airport. 
But if they did not recite the talbiyah, then they would not be in this state of ihram. They could have removed, they could have worn normal clothes, be a bit more comfortable. That's why you should recite talbiyah, this is to some advice, on the flight that is going to land in Jeddah. On the flight that's going to land in Jeddah. And once you are actually sat on the flight and the flight has taken off, now they can't remove you. Clear? So, uh, once we're on the flight and the flight has taken off, the flight that's going to land in Jeddah, do all the other stuff beforehand. But read the Dalbiya, do the injunction and read the Dalbiya then. Now you have become a muhrim. You must become a muhrim before entering the Miqat. So you have the Kaaba, Al Masjid Al Haram, and you have a big circle going round many miles away, and that's called Miqat. The boundary that you can't enter without being in the state of Ihram. If you enter without being in the state of Ihram, then you must, after you land, you can go to Masjid Al Jiridana. That's another cost for you. You get a taxi there, you put your ihram on there, and then you come back and perform on So that's why you put on your ihram, become a muhrim before entering the Miqat. Usually flights from UK, they pass through an area, uh, close to an area called Rabin. About 40 minutes before <coughs> landing time in Jeddah, you should make, you should ensure that you are in the state of ihram. Clear? Once you land now at the airport, you might want to go and refresh it yourself. There's really nice soaps there, there's nice you know, gels there. Can you use that? Why? In the state of Ihram, you can't do that. Okay? Uh, so that's one thing really important to uh, bear in mind. Any questions on Ihram? So we've had profound Musul Wudu. Where the two sheets, okay, the two sheets, they must be unsewn, meaning they can't be sewn like pajamas or trousers, etc. Uh, pray to Nakar Salah, make intention for Umrah, recite Talbiyah, and then about uh, women we mentioned today. Any questions? If you're a female, if you have females going with you, if they are in the state of menstruation, then they can do all of this. They can't pray the two rakat salat because you can't pray salat at that time. But they can do everything else. And then when they become clean, then they will go to perform their umrah. But this again comes to comes down to what I mentioned earlier on: plan your journey. Okay. Oh, wow. So once we're in the state of Ihram, we'll go through the immigration, you will go through immigration, they'll come to their hotel, check yourself in, if you need to you know, freshen up, do that, everything, perform wudu. To perform tawaf, you must be in the state of wudu. Can you press salat without wudu? If during salat your wudu breaks, what do you do? You go, perform wudu, come back. It's the same with tawaf. You cannot perform tawaf without wudu. Even if it's nafal tawaf. Say it wasn't part of your umrah. After your umrah, you're doing nafal tawaf. You must be in the state of wudu. Okay? So, once you come in the state of ihram to Al Masjid Al Haram, as soon as you see the, all the way, all the way from when you recite the talbiyah, increase the recitation of talbiyah as much as possible. Okay, men should decide slightly aloud. Women, just that they can hear themselves, nobody else can hear. But that's what you should be reciting as much as possible. Talbiya, <coughs> Talbiya. You're saying the translation in, 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 of the words is that Allah, I am present. You invited me, I am here, Allah. Labbaik, Allah, I have accepted your call, your invitation. That's what you're saying to Allah. So just continue reciting Talbiya. As soon as you come into Masjid al Haram and you see the Kaaba, now you stop Talbiya. Now you stop telling me. Now you make dua. The first time you see the Kaaba, as, as much dua as you like, you should recite all the duas that is in your memory. If it's not in Arabic, then in your own language say the duas. Ask from Allah. Okay? 
After you make dua, then now you're going to perform tawaf. First of all, you make intention. So what you do is, the four corners, there were specific doors that is mustahab to enter through al-masjid al-haram, like Babu salam etc. It's very difficult to get to them doors with the building work and uh, extension work going on. And the, the, the people performing Umrah will make one door now anyway. Everybody goes through that door. So once you come in, you see the Kaaba the first time, then you make dua. After you made your dua, then you come down into the Mataf. All this area around the Kaaba is called Mataf. Tawaf and Mataf. That place is called Mataf, meaning the place of Tawaf. Once you come, before you join, you need to find out where the Hajj al is. Easy way to find out where Hajj al is, is just look where the police is standing. It's always standing there because that's where the crowd is. People are pushing one another to kiss the Hajj al If there's no one there, on the construction, you will see green light. Before, if you read some old books, then you'll say that there's a, a brown line. That used to, uh, used to exist. I saw that brown line. But everybody used to come there, there was a lot of pushing there. So they got rid of that brown line. And now, you can see the, on, on the construction, uh, a, a green light. And that green light is the starting point. Before it, you start, you make intention and, and, and do the istila. Okay? So once you've found where the starting point is, Hajar Aswad, you don't go past Hajar Aswad. Before Hajar Aswad, you keep Hajar Aswad to your right hand side. You're still on the left hand side of Hajj as well. And you make intention. Again, in your own language, you can make intention that Allah, I am uh, I intend to perform tawaf now, accept my tawaf, make it easy for me, etc. Okay? So performing tawaf, the intention is for. In salah, intention is for, isn't it? In the same way, before you perform tawaf, intention is for. So you make intention, and now we do. Istilam. Istilam is that if we can, then we go in front of the Hajj al-Aswad. But that's not easy. People who have been, they will. Okay, it's not easy. But if you were able to go in front of the Hajj al-Aswad, and you place your palms, and then you kiss the Hajj al-Aswad without making a sound, and by saying, Bismillahi, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alham, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, etc., then that's your istilam done. If you can't reach and touch the Hajj as well, then the Masla says that if there's a stick, stick or staff or anything, but that's not possible as well. Okay? If you try to go with the stick, you won't do your umrah. So don't try that. The third option, which is the safest option and the best option for us is that from wherever we are, we face our hands towards the Hajj as well, like we do for the Qur'an Tahrirah. And then we say, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar, Walillahi Alhamd, etc. And after we've done the istilam, like this, and we, we pretend that we're in front of it, like this, kiss, kiss our palms, and that's it. Okay. Now we keep the Kaaba on our left hand side. In Salat, can you turn around everywhere? You have to be facing this. In the same way, when you perform Tawaf, you can't face the Kaaba. You can't be facing Kaaba and going down. Your Tawaf will be accepted. You keep your left hand side towards the Kaaba and you look forward, not at the Kaaba. You look forward and you just go around reciting du'as. You can recite Quran if you want, but the best is to recite du'as. And the best du'as are those du'as mentioned in the Quran and mentioned in the Hadith. Those people who are going with us in the group have been sending du'as every like three, four days. If you've been memorizing, this all comes down to planning your journey, learning everything. There you can, you know, you'll see people, books, and it's a distraction, holding a book, trying to remember how many times you've been around. You want to be free-minded, and you want to read du'as. If you know one or two du'as, to speak those one or two du'as all the way, so never think to yourself, I've said this hundred times now, I'm sure God's done me. There's no such thing. Carry on, carry on, carry on. Don't waste time there. Don't think to yourself, you know, I've read all these words already. 
He naturally, human being, you feel it because he goes seven times round Kaaba, seven times Safa Marwa, and it's all du'as. Carry on asking Allah whatever you can. So the best du'as, du'as from Quran, du'as from Hadith, and read the du'as there. Okay? Because that's a place where du'a is accepted. Quran Sharif you can recite anytime, anyway. But you can't do tawaf anyway. Tawaf is only there. So now keeping the uh, Kaaba to your left hand side, you go around and you need to make sure you go around the Hadim. Around the Hadim. All the way around. This is not the original corner of the Kaaba. And this corner is not the original corner of the Kaaba. But it looks like the corner of the Kaaba. So why is it? Why am I saying it's not the original corner? Yeah, yeah mashallah, because the Hadim was part of the Kaaba, if you remember, I explained. So the original corners are not these two. So that's why we do nothing at this corner, nothing at that corner. What happens when you do Tawaf? You see, those of people doing something, they all, I, maybe I should do this. Well, everybody is doing this, maybe we should do this as well. Learn things before you go. You know, don't follow, follow the people, follow the books, follow the Quran and Hadith. So you go around doing nothing, and all of this you'll see that people are more scattered about now. It's more relaxed down here. When you come here, this is called Rukne Yamani. <coughs> okay? Yamani corner. Rukne Yamani. Rukne means corner. Here, what you can do is just touch. That's it. Okay? And there's no like coming out for you know, kiss, anything like that. Just touch and carry. If you can, without any pushing uh, other people. If you can, then you carry on. And from here, to here, the best dua to recite is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatahu wa fil akhirati hasanatahu wa qina adhab al Can you read that from there begin? From here it will slow down because everybody is going to pause here to do the istilam again. So from here to here it's busy again. And then when you come here you do what you did the first time, istilam again. And now you now number two. Then number three. All the way around until you have completed seven circuits. Okay? Seven circuits. If whilst you're performing tawaf, your wudu breaks. If your wudu breaks, then you have to do wudu again. There is water around. Uh, if it's easy, if, if easily you can perform wudu, then just perform wudu and come back. If you go out, then you will have to walk all the way around. And then come back in. It becomes a very uh, long um, uh, journey. So that's why, within the uh, in the in the construction, there will be water allowed. You can quickly perform wudu there, <coughs> but you can't carry on without wudu. Okay. If it's salat time, you perform two tawaf and it's maghrib time, asr time. You'll see people making rows, and you can't do tawaf anymore for whatever reason. Then sit down, pray your salat. When Salat finishes, you carry on, you don't have to start again from number one. Now in doing Tawaf, there's two things that we have to uh, bear in mind. One is, if after a Tawaf there is uh, Sa'i, which in our Umrah there will be, then we do Ifdiba. Okay? Ifdiba is throughout, meaning all these seven rounds. So that's how we were. Ifdiba is to expose our right shoulder. Right shoulder exposed, left one. Okay. Ulama mentioned that the reason for this is that we have kiram and katibi. Good deeds are written, bad deeds are written. So we've covered the left saying, Allah, don't look at our bad deeds. We've exposed our right hand side, Allah, accept all our good deeds. You understand? The one other thing we do, which is only for the first three rounds. And that's called Ramal. Ramal is to walk bravely. Okay, you're showing that with bravery, you're walking. Why we do this is that the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to perform Umrah, then the Meccans, the chief, they were not Muslims at the time. Mecca wasn't conquered yet. They said that the heat of Mecca, or the weather of Medina, etc., uh, these Muslims, it, it has weakened the Muslims. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not powerful, etc. They're not strong anymore. So Allah's Rasul said, show them our bravery. When they see us from the 
mountain tops, etc., when they see us from the hills around, then they will see that we still have power within us. So Ramadan. If in the fourth round you remember, oh, I forgot to do Ramadan, then there's no qadha of Ramadan. You don't do Ramadan in fourth, fifth, sixth. If in the second round you remember you forgot Ramadan in the first, you just carry on in the second one, third one, up to the third one and that's it. Okay? So il riba is throughout, but Ramadan is only in the first three. The eighth time, when you've completed seven and you're here for the eighth time, you do istilaf again. But your tawaf has finished now. Tawaf has finished now. Now, you will pray two rakat salat. These two rakat salat is wajib to pray. Okay, it's not nafar or sunnah. It's wajib to pray. Allah says in the Quran, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى Take behind the station of Maqam Ibrahim to be a place of Salat, pray to Rakat Salat there. So you, you, you come, you'll see loads of people praying there without pushing and you know, causing any distress to anyone. When you find space, Allahu Akbar. And again, قُلْ يَا يُوْهَا الْكَافِرُونَ in the first Rakat, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَعَدْ in the second Rakat. These two Rakats are wajib. If it's Makru time, then wait till the Makru time finishes. Okay? And then, once you perform the two Rakat, Drink as much zamzam as you can. In one hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma zamzam lima shuribala. That for whatever intention a person drinks the water of zamzam, then that intention will be fulfilled, inshallah. And the dua we recite before drinking zamzam water is, Allahumma inna nas'aluka ilman nafi'a. It's a beautiful dua. Then, O oh Allah, I ask you for abundance in risk. Uh, I ask you for beneficial knowledge, abundance in risk, and cure from all illnesses. After that, if you can, then you go to the Muntazim and click on to that for a bit and make dua. Again, you'll see that there's a lot of pushing, etc. Uh, and recently, there's many women who are doing all the pushing, not men. So they're taking over. But anyway, if you can't, you leave, and then now we've completed our tawaf, slide is finished. What were the four things we do in Umrah? Number one is? Ihram we've done. Number two is? Tawaf we've done. What are the two things there? Sa'i and then? Halaq. Sa'i now. When we do Sa'i, so from the uh, Hadim on this side toward this side, You'll see that there is uh, the besides and uh, it said towards Mas'a. It's called Mas'a, the place of Sa'i. You go towards uh, Mas'a. Mas'a is one mount called Safa and the second is called Marwa. In the Safa wal Marwata min Allah says in the Quran. Allah mentioned them in the Quran. That Mount Safa, Mount Marwa are the two signs of Allah. And here what we're doing is reminding ourselves of the sacrifice made by uh, Hajra, by Ismail alayhi salam's mother, when she was looking for water for her son. So what we do is, we go and ascend onto Mount Safa. Now, if you think it will be before you think of a big mountain, it's not a big, huge mountain. It's come down now and because of the building work, etc. You can see the original stones Original, you know, uh, rocks, etc. When you climb up, it's glass off. You can see the original stone. But other than that, from there, it's all marble for the ease of us to do the uh, sa'i. So you look towards, I'm on Mount Safa now, you climb on, and then you look towards the Kaaba. You can see the Kaaba from there. You look towards the Kaaba and you make dua again. It's all about dua, all duas. You make plenty of dua, and once you've made your dua, then you start to come down and you go all the way to Marwa. On your way, you will see above there's green lights. For men, in the, the, the duration of the green lights, you do brisk walking. You walk slightly faster. Okay? The reason for that is that that's where Hajara, she did brisk walking and she was you know, looking for water. So remind us, to remind ourselves of that, we do that as well. Once you reach Marwa, 
you do the same. You might not be, you won't be able to see the Kaaba from there, but you face the direction of the Kaaba, make dua again, and then you come back down. Again, green lights, brisk walking. So from Safa to Marwa is one round. From Marwa to Safa is a second round. Then third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Once you reach Marwa, that's the seventh one done. You start from Safa, end with Marwa. Clear? In between, all you do is dua. Just duas. That's it. After that, you pray two rakat salah. That's your sari complete as well. After sari is complete, you will see near the exit there, there are people stood with scissors. Don't use them. Okay? Don't use them. You've, you've spent a lot of money, you've gone for umrah, you want the, you want the most reward. You don't want to come back with small amount, do you? You want to maximize reward. The maximum reward is in halaq, not in qasr. But the way they do the qasr, your qasr is not complete as well. So that's why you have to walk all the way back, and then you will see people who will try to, uh, it's all business there for them. They'll say, come with me, come to my barber shop, etc. You go to the barber shop, you have to pay them, so that's why when you are leaving your hotel, carry with you 20 riyals, 15 riyals, depending on how many people are with you. So, once you shave with your hair, now you can come out of your haram. Now all those things that became uh, forbidden, now becomes halal for you again. Now you've completed your umrah. Now you are uh, a mu'adami, you finished, mashallah. Women, they will go back to the hotel and then it's a good idea to take a pair of scissors and round their finger, take the end of the hair around once, okay, properly, and then just cut from there. And that's their qasr. Once you have done your halaq, you can go and do their, do their uh, cut their hair for them. If we are making tawaf, in between if we go to the toilet for any reason, then we'll come back. Will continue the same, or will should start from the beginning? So and same in same in sahi also. Yeah. No, uh, sorry. If your wudu breaks, you uh, you can carry on. Okay. Yeah. But you should try to have wudu. There's plenty of places in Basra to do wudu. But uh, sorry, you don't need to have wudu. But in tawaf you do. So in tawaf, if you break your wudu, if you go to the toilet, if you go out and you come back, you're going to start. You're going to see in front of you. Or you're going to pass by the Hajj al-Asmat before you get to anywhere else. You carry on from wherever you left off basically. But just to be on the same side, to start from the beginning again. Meaning from the Hajj al-Asmat again. But because when you think that I left here, I left here, it's confusing sometimes. Because it's just open space. So if you did three already and the fourth one you have to go to wudu again, go to wudu again. If you know wherever where your wudu broke, then you carry on from, uh, from there. But the best option is for the uh, ease of your mindset that you, you definitely, because there's a lot of people who suffer from uh, the illness of doubt. Um, and uh, that's why it's best to start from there and you know that now that it was complete. <coughs> Gee. What about safety pins in the Iran? Yeah, that's fine. Safety pins, if you have like, uh, you know, like nowadays you see some different like, buttons, etc. The main thing is ihram can't be sewn, stitched in the shape of like a shirt or a, a thobe, a jubba, or pajamas or trousers. It has to be plain open sheet. So for a safety pin, if you really need one and you want to put one on, it, it, it's permissible. It's permissible to have belt on. In the state of ihram, you can wear your watch as well. In the state of ihram, you can, uh, uh, you know, these kind of things, but you can't cover your head. You can't cover your feet. Okay. You mentioned about putting the ihram you know, over your shoulder. When is that done? Before the law. Yeah. So when you pray your two rakats ihram, you cover the full, both shoulders. You only do the ibar when you start your tawaf. Just before you start your tawaf. Okay. So Jazakumullah khair for coming. Uh, one minute, I'm not finished yet. You perform the Umrah, Umrah is complete. Spend as much time as you can in reciting the Quran, spending time in uh, Masjid al-Haram, 
except that when you go for ziyarat, I'm not going to go through and explain in each and every single place here. Usually they take you to these places. But don't think, you know, I'm not performing Hajj, why should I go there? It's good to go there, bring that visualization of what it's like in, 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 in Mina, Muzdalifa, Arafah. So Mina, Arafah, Muzdalifa, these are places to visit. People spend time there in the Hajj. When, they, when there's Ghari uh, Thor, Ghari Thor is where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was performing uh, the Hijrah, he was leaving for Medina, he went and he took protection in Ghari Thor. People go early in the morning to climb, sometimes they close it off and you can't go. Most of the time, a lot of people climb, climb and reach to the, to the Prophet's valley. Then you have Ghari Hira, that's the place of the first revelation. Again, people go climbing there as well. Um, we have Masjid al Jin. That's when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he met with the jinns to convey the message of Islam to them. There's nothing scary. Some people don't go because it's called Masjid al Jin. Okay, but there's no virtue of going there as well. It's not like you're going to receive more reward praying salat in Masjid al Jin. The only place you're going to receive more reward praying salat is Masjid al Haram. Masjid al Nabawi and Masjid al Aqsa. Okay? Um, al Mu'alla graveyard, so that's the graveyard of Makkah al Mukarramah, Khadija al Kubra, that the Allah is buried there, and there are many other people buried there as well. The uh, Prophet's place of birth, when, when, when you come out, it was a library, uh, it's a small building there, one floor. Uh, when you come out from Marwa side, you can see it there. So people who are coming with it, inshallah, I'll give you detailed information. Uh, then when you go to Medina, when you go to Medina, in Medina what we're doing is we're going with the intention to pray Salat there and receive more reward. That's our intention. Okay? <laughs> Obviously when we're there, we're going to do Ziyarat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and pray. When you go, you can do Ziyarat at any time. It's open 24 hours from uh, the front first day, Babu Salah. But to pray in the Rawdah, Rawdah to pray in Riyadh and Jannah, you have to download the Yusuf app and you have to book a slot. Without that, they're very strict, they're not going to let you go in. Okay? Unless you know some dodgy ways. Right? Aja. This is, uh, so this is, when you, when you, when you walk, you enter through Babu Salaam, you reach the end, before the end you will see uh, gates and you'll see a guards there. Now, this is what it says, it says Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just behind here is the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Slightly moving forward it says Abu Bakr, that's where Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and then Umar ibn al-Khattab, that's where Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala and who is buried, okay? All three there. Now what people do is, there's big circles there, they try to look through and try to take photos and book, um, the light on. I've seen so many things. This person, he threw a letter there. <laughs> As though the Prophet is going to open the letter and read this letter. Nothing, all you do is when you go there with utmost respect, you stand there and you say, As facing As-salamu wa salamu alayka ya Rasulullah, As-salamu wa salamu alayka ya Habib Allah, etc. You learn this before you go. Okay? <laughs> and also people will say, send my salam. So you say on behalf of so and so, on behalf of so and so. And that's all that you do there. There's nothing else to do there. Okay? When you're approaching, you will see in the old section of the masjid there are these pillars. Before, when we first uh, when I first went many times, uh, then it was really easy to enter. There was no rusuk up, you could go whenever, there was always space. Really nice. Now this, 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 you know, it's sometimes quite difficult to get in. But I used to show people these pillars because each pillar has a significance. Something happened. They call Ustuwara, Ustuwara to Hiz, Ustuwara to Wufud, Ustuwara to Sarif, Ustuwara to Aisha. Many different pillars that they have significance. So here are those pillars on the top. You will see like a golden ring and then green background and gold writing. It's fancy calligraphy writing. But he says which pillar it is. Okay. 
So the masjid is three parts. The original masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the expansion of the Ottoman Empire, and then the expansion of the Saudi government. Okay? Is you can easily kind of see the differences in the where the build the construction of the masjid is. And then there's places in Medina that you can go for ziyarah. This is these are all my own photos, okay? There's no copyright on this. This is I, I, this this photo reminds me of this is the graveyard of Medina Tul Munawwara. After Fajr Salat and after Uda Salat, they open it as well. Men can go in, they don't allow women. And you go in and you do ziyarah. Okay? Many Sahaba Ikram, many scholars, even our scholars from India, Sheikh Zakaria Rahimahullah, very famous, he is buried there. There are many other scholars as well who are buried there. So you can see graves dug, you can see people being buried. After every salat, there's Janazah Salat. After every salat, there's Janazah Salat. But look, the way is that it's a start of another day, the sun is rising. This was after Fajr. Sun is rising, you can see, and there are some people living their life in the grave, and some people on top of that. Some under earth, some on top of earth, living their life. Everybody here is going to have also an of grave. This reminds you. But all living, the people in the grave are alive as well in their own life. Not like us, they have to eat and drink. But they are under earth, we are on top of earth today, and that's where we are going to be. There's other places to visit, like Masjid al Qibla Day. That's where the Qibla changed in Salat. There's Masjid al Quba, the first Masjid that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam built. There's the Khandaq Masjid as well, the seven, it's called the seven mosques, seven places where the Prophet and Sahaba Ikram prayed Salat. Some, there's small, small constructions. Inshallah, I will tell you more. Then there's the field of Uhud, the field of Mount, Mount Uhud, and that's where the Battle of Uhud happened. When you're going from Makkah to Medina, if you can, then pass through Badr field. That's where the battle of Badr happened. So that's the end of our Umrah workshop. Jazakumullah khairan for coming uh, and joining. I hope it's been beneficial.